Welcome, everyone. Great to see so many people out uh, this evening. I'm Brian Schmidt, the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National uh, University. Uh, and as appropriate as part of our National Reconciliation Week and tonight's topic, uh, we had hoped to have a welcome to country uh, from Auntie Matilda House, but unfortunately, she has been uh, delayed. And so uh, I'm going to provide an acknowledgment to country uh, instead. Uh, so, uh, we are meeting here on Ngunnawal Nambri land, uh, land that has been the traditional meeting place for the people of, the, of this area for millennia. Uh, a place that we uh, are proud to call the National University and the area Cambry that we are actually on today, gifted to us by the indigenous families here in uh, the uh, Canberra region. So we're very grateful for that, and we are uh, delighted that we can continue those millennia traditions and be a meeting place for modern Australia as well. So uh, when we look at uh, reconciliation, uh, we have had a a really busy last week here uh, at ANU. And I hope many of you will have seen uh, the uh, repatriation cere uh, ceremony we had with the Galawinko people who were down uh, on force here last week. A uh, really important part of where we can uh, make amends for what was uh, uh, a lack of respect done by researchers who at some level, I guess, did not know better but collected samples without the consent of the people uh, that they took them from. And so we have had through, uh, I think, a really positive program over the last several years, uh, discussions with uh, the, uh, the uh, indigenous Australians uh, whose samples were taken and working with them about repa repatriating them, but also using uh, uh, essentially the digital copies of of those samples to further medicine for their benefit. And so that's been a really important part of what journey we've been on this week. Today, uh, we're going to have a distinguished panel, and we welcome Fran Kelly back uh, tonight, who will uh, chair it. But we have the Honorable Linda Burney. Uh, great to have you back on our campus. Uh, Fiona Cornworth and Professor Ray Francis and Geraldine Chin Moody. Thank you all for making the time to be here and contributing your expertise to such an important discussion. This week has been a time for reflection, and I told one thing that we did with the Galawinko people, but it is a time uh, each year to reflect on how far we've come with reconciliation, but also how far we have to go. Uh, we must acknowledge and confront our past mistakes of history. And as I said that, uh, what we did last week, I think it's a good example how we can turn uh, past mistakes into something uh, that is beneficial. Uh, and certainly the way we approach it is by looking forward uh, and committing to being part of a solution and trying to commit our staff and our students to thinking about the solutions themselves uh, of reaching out and working with First Nations people and take those 60,000 years of history, making it a shared history and something that propels us all forward uh, to make Australia stronger and better. That is something we're really trying to focus on this week here. Uh, things we're looking at uh, are, of course, intersect with other issues, and one of that includes the treatment of women. Domestic and sexual violence against women is a prominent issue in Australia. We see this both in our indigenous and non-indigenous communities. And with recent events across the nation, now more than ever, people need to come together, support each other, and demand change. The status quo is just simply not OK. All women have the right to feel safe and protected. And part of reconciliation is about being on this journey together. As I've said, we can only make a difference if we all work as one, continue to break down the barriers that hold us back. And as I said, by doing this, we think we can benefit the whole nation. It's not just ourselves, it's everyone. Tonight, we are joined 
by a panel of leading women and advocates who are champions of change and work hard to make a positive impact. And so I'm going to invite Fran Kelly on, uh, up. And under uh, her guidance, our panel is going to explore what changes we could make if indigenous and non-indigenous people come together uh, and work towards meaningful, lasting change. Uh, and I look forward to uh, learning a lot tonight. And so Fran, over to you. Uh, we'll leave you uh, in your trustworthy hands. Thanks very much, Brian, and thank all of you. Thanks all of you for coming out tonight in Reconciliation Week. Perhaps we do always need to start with just looking back and dealing with the notion of reconciliation itself. In the year 2000, probably many of us here walked across a bridge together in Sydney or in Melbourne or in streets and parks in towns and cities across the country as a show of support and enthusiasm for the reconciliation process. 21 years on, how has that process progressed? What does reconciliation look like in each of our daily lives? What are we doing to contribute to it? It's a question we need to keep asking. Are Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians any closer, really, to coming together in understanding, to understand each other, to trust each other, to work together for better outcomes, for First Australians in particular, than we had two decades ago? And the statistics aren't encouraging. We know them. Uh, there are a litany of disappointment and tragedy in too many cases and going backwards in too many cases. Right now, as, as Brian mentioned, a pressing issue for the nation is the safety of women, prompted by the actions of a young former political staffer called Brittany Higgins, who came out three years ago alleging she was raped in a minister's office in Parliament House here in Canberra. Her description of the response of ministers and senior government staffers to her ordeal was both shocking and familiar, particularly for the many, many women who've endured sexual assault and harassment in workplaces, in communities and in families over generations. Her account gave a picture of feigned interest, callous disregard, weak institution protocols, just a, a general sense of inconvenience or worse denial and blame. Certainly not one of good enough care and response. Galvanised by Brittany Higgins' bravery in speaking truth to power, the women of Australia came out in force to tell the government, enough. And after a few goes of getting it right, the Morrison government finally responded in the May budget with a package of reforms for women's safety and security. There was double the money for more community legal sp support, for better resourced family court processes, for frontline services like helplines and emergency accommodation, and grants for women fleeing violence. There was some, a little bit, for all of those things, and that was an improvement. There was $26 million earmarked specifically to improve support services for our First Nations women. So far, so good. But the clamour and the headlines sparked by Brittany Higgins' allegations prompted some Indigenous women to put their hand up and say, hey, what about us? Yes, sexual assault and domestic violence are experienced by all women. But why was it, they asked, that disclosures by white women gain international attention, whereas sexual violence against Indigenous women is too often normalised and rendered invisible? This was the question posed in an open letter by three senior Aboriginal academics, Associate Professor Hannah McGlade, Dr Marlene Longbottom and Professor Bronwyn Carlson, who made the point that one in three Indigenous women and girls will be raped in their lifetime, and yet our state and federal governments fail to respond, and the nation fails to take enough notice. They called for Indigenous and non-Indigenous women to come together in solidarity and respond with respect for each other to work together to end the violence against women. Now that would surely be an important step along the path to reconciliation. Our all-female panel tonight is a blend of youth and experience, Indigenous and non-Indigenous women. Linda Burney, can I invite you up on stage? Linda Burney is the Federal Labor Member for Barton. She's a proud Wiradjuri woman who was the first Aboriginal person elected to the New South Wales Parliament and the first Aboriginal woman elected to the Federal House of Representatives. She served as a minister in the state government and a shadow minister across a range of portfolios federally. She's currently the shadow minister for families and Indigenous Australians.
Professor Ray Francis is the Dean of the College of Arts and Social Sciences and Professor of History here at the ANU. She's a widely published author with a deep interest in the struggles between dominant and non-dominant cultures. Fiona Cornforth is the CEO of the Healing Foundation, which many of you might know is a national Indigenous organisation working with communities to address the ongoing trauma of forced removals and ensuing stolen generations. A proud Wathathi woman from far north Cape of Queensland, she too is an alumni of ANU, where she has a master's graduate at, of the College of Business and Economics. And Geraldine Chin Moody is the co-founder of 5H Values Capital and a non-executive director of Future Super, which is an ethical superannuation fund. She's held senior leadership roles in corporate Australia, including with the ASX and Virgin. She's a passionate champion of inclusion and diversity, and she's also been on the board of UN Women and Refugee Advice and Casework Service and Welcoming Australia. Would you please welcome the esteemed panel? Turn this on. One, two. Yes, that's working. Thank you. Um, I should be better with a microphone than that. I apologise. Uh, Linda Burney, just first an update, really, uh, not so much in the realm of reconciliation, but you've been up on the hill at federal parliament while this debate about sexual assault and harassment has been playing out. In that building, does it feel to you that progress is being made, that a culture in that place that we have all now seen can be sexist, even predatory for some young women, is being forced to change? Uh, it does feel like things have certainly moved. I'm not sure if changed is the right word. Um, Fran spoke about the bravery of Brittany Higgins um, and incredibly brave what she has done and the way in which she pursues the issue. There was money in the budget, that's true, but uh, you would not be surprised if I said I think that was more about throwing bits of money at a political problem more than a systemic way of dealing with the issues. Uh, for me, Fran, it's taking way too long. I mean, I have agency up there. Uh, women that are members of parliament of a certain generation uh, do not experience what a 22-year-old staffer experiences. And I think the voices of those staffers are very important. And just to finish up, on, that, on what I'm saying. It just seems to me that uh, the structural problems, that there has been a change culturally. There's no two ways about that. But I'm not sure that the structural changes that are required are there. For example, uh, there are, I don't know how many MPs there are, but just say there's 150. There's 150 employers. We employ our own staff. So uh, that, to me, is a structural problem. Where do those staff go if the employer is the predator? Yeah. That's going to need to change, and we are, we're still waiting on those inquiries. But um, you would think that that, at the very least, is one structural issue that will change. Um, just from your vantage point as an Indigenous woman who's achieved a senior place in the top institutions of the nation, I wonder, do you... Do you share the frustrations of Hannah McGlade and the others? Do you see racism underlying the response of the nation to, or well, the differing response, I suppose, to the horrific murder of Hannah Clark and her children, of the, uh, to the allegations of rape made by Brittany Higgins, compared to the reaction to the murder of Indigenous women and the un unacceptable rates of family violence within some Indigenous communities? I think, and I know Hannah personally, I think Hannah... Um, and the people that wrote that open letter make a really important point is, you know, it's okay to have outrage and anger, but that, that has to go somewhere. And the point that I have been making is that where is the voice of marginalised women in this discussion? And one of those groups, of course, are First Nations women who um, suffer more 
in terms of assault and murder and hospitalisation than the rest of the community because of domestic and family violence. And the issue for me is not just about the deaths, it's actually about the people that are maimed and end up with head trauma and head injuries that affect them for the rest of their lives. There is not enough uh, voices from women from a cold background. There are not enough voices of people from the LGBTQI community. Those voices, if we're going to truly change the culture of this country, those voices have to be prominent in the discussion. And I don't think that they are now. For example, and I'll finish on this point, the way in which Aboriginal women see this issue is very different to the way that non-Aboriginal women see this issue. It's not about the individual. It's about the family. It's about the community. It's about the men. It's about the well-being of everyone, not just about one person. And I can tell you that the way in which the media reports um, on, on the constant death and maiming of Aboriginal women is extremely different to the way in which, uh, as Fran has said, uh, sensational reports of white middle-class women um, are reported. Well, I think the issue, too, is it often just does not even get reported, and there's a whole lot loaded in that. Mm -hmm. um, and what you just said there, we need to hear the voices. This is not a new refrain. This is, seems to be the point we get to too often, which goes to what I was saying in the 21 years since 2000, have we moved far? Ray, as an historian, I mean, what are the lessons here about attitudes to First Nations people? Because this particular debate is not special to Australia. Women everywhere are subjected to male violence, of course. But in the US, for instance, there's a, a movement called the Say Her Name, a response by black women to the invisibility of their deaths at the hands of police and others. Um, yeah, look, I think it's um, a really important comparison to make and we can learn a lot from other um, jurisdictions, not just the US, Canada and New Zealand, for example, where we have powerful First Nations voices being very active on that point. But in the Australian context, I think um, it's it's very interesting, you know, the point about the, the differential reporting of white and non-white. But... Um, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that sometimes it takes reporting of something close to home before people stand up and take notice. So um, the first women to get into education were often there because um, their fathers thought, well, that's pretty unfair. I've got this really clever um, daughter and she can't get into university. And often it was powerful white men who advocated. And I think what's really struck home with um, Brittany Higgins' case is that a lot of powerful white men in Australia think that could have been my daughter and it's made a difference. And that opens up the discussion where people look more broadly at what else is going on in that space. So um, what um, those three Indigenous women said is absolutely true, but I think it's not all negative. OK, well, Fiona, on that in terms of, you know, opening up discussion of, of what needs to happen, it's your generation of Indigenous women who will be the architects of change and Indigenous young men. How, how can you see this happening? What are you... What, what needs to happen for the women in your community to feel safe and for the men to commit to make it so? Well, we need to get this um, intergenerational healing movement underway. Um, a lot of the issues that we're faced with in our communities are down to the fact that um, there were policies that removed us from families, from loving and nurturing families, and it affects um, more of us and our populations um, than, you, than you would think. It has a significant impact, um, the, the rate of removal um, across this country. And so um, that is historical trauma that has yet to be addressed. Uh, and when you're faced with that, when you're operating and functioning in life from a place of distress, how can you possibly take on bigger fights 
um, on, on behalf of all women, of all Indi Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. It's, it's really difficult, but, um, uh, you know, we are buoyed. As, as, the, as the Healing Foundation, um, we've been able to work alongside communities who have solutions and women who are uh, empowered more than ever to, um, to overcome trauma to understand that it's a human experience and that it's uh, our, our cultures, um, there are elements in our cultures that have always kept us safe and well. And if we re, um, restore those things, we reprioritize them, um, you know, we can lead healing in our communities. And uh, I guess um, one of the big things that's front of mind for me is a visit um, to the Yaru country um, and meeting with Kimberley Aboriginal women, over a hundred of them recently. Um, myself and my deputy CEO got to go along as observers. They wanted us there because we could bring the evidence and the research um, around effective healing, um, but they had the solutions and it was amazing, amazing to watch. Um, they used uh, June Oscar, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner's report, which has those four priority actions that include intergenerational healing or addressing intergenerational trauma. Uh, and they spent 12 hours over three days each day, 12 hours, um, um, putting, putting actions against each of those priorities. And can you tell us a little more about that, Fiona? Because, mm. you know, the, the intergenerational healing, and I know you're, you're giving a major address at the National Press Club tomorrow, laying out some of the, the data and, and which underlies sort of this connection to intergenerational trauma and, and, and the aftermath, if you like, that still carries through today. But it, it, it doesn't sound to me like a, a quick fix. I mean, this, there is an urgent matter to be done here to keep women safe when you look at, you know, the horrific rates of, of violence and hospitalisation, as Linda was saying. But so what are some of those solutions and are they seeing, because, you know, you can also look on and go, well, is that just a cop out for the black men that they, you know, are, are hiding behind international, intergenerational trauma? What's some of the, the changes that are being made, the actions taken, are they having any short term impact that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. And it's creating safe spaces to tell your truth and to be heard and to seek help and support in each other like we like we always did, like we did before, you know. And um, so that's, that's something that comes to mind. But I um, can tell you that I saw exactly what Aunty Linda said before. It's um, uh, that we look at the whole family. We... We look at the men. Uh, you know, there was a pr presentation about um, how we're going to catch perpetrators, and these women said, "Hang on, you're talking about my brothers. You're talking about my dads, and my, you know." And and um, it it occurred to me then, and you know, in my reflections in Reconciliation Week, that we have these uh, wonderful matriarchs that inspire us and who've led these movements for so long, but they've also absorbed so much. They've also taken the brunt of, um, you know, thing, things like um, Hannah McGlade and, and others spoke about. They've, um, so that my generation uh, and, and future generations can be stronger and freer, like freedom from trauma experiences, and um, that was acknowledged as well. Uh, and, you know, that's important for us to draw strength from, but it's... Um, and, you know, we've got wonderful partnerships in the Torres Strait with um, Murakoska soror Sorority, um, and they work with the perpetrators, and, and they're not the only ones across the country, but they're leading the way. This small little organisation in the Torres Strait saying, Very we're going we're gonna to heal our men. We're going to lead this intergenerational healing because we've always known how to lead. Um, uh, sorry, how to heal. Our cultures um, have provided for it, uh, and um, we we need everyone else to get on board. Geraldine, I wonder if you have a reflection on that, but also taking away from that sphere. I mean, violence against women is not just an issue for Indigenous women, and the nation has been confronted on, on folk, you know, focused on confronting the, 
the the incidence of workplace harassment and sexual assault more broadly. We keep hearing our parliament is way behind the cultural change within corporate Australia, yet violence against women happens everywhere and it seems to happen all the time and those terrible statistics about police being called out to a domestic violence incident once every two minutes tells us that. Are the corporate workplaces, is the corp corporate world much different when you scratch the surface? And, as Fiona's just told us, have you come across programs uh, that have small worked well that could be uh, as, a, as a reference to, to broaden out and replicate and, and make change? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Fran. Um, so I think, I mean, from a corporate perspective, um, when we look at creating an inclusive environment that supports um, people from, you know, all different backgrounds, it's important for us to think about how we move organisations through a, what I call a maturity journey from being compli basic compliance, like making sure they comply, making sure they're investing in changing mindsets and breaking down unconscious bias and getting rid of um, discrimination within their systems, and then moving to integrate it into the way that they do business. Um, and I think business can go about... Um, trying to address this by, by helping to role model some of the policies that might work more broadly across the sector. So, for example, when I was at Virgin, um, you know, five or six years ago, we put in place with the unions, working closely with the TWU and others, um, 10 days of paid family domestic violence leave. Um, and we use that as a chance to educate the workforce on why that was important. Um, and in doing that, you're speaking with 10,000 people, um, you're um, putting in place structures and systems, you're giving direct access to senior members of leadership. Um, and what we saw is, I mean, I was in the position of group executive of people at that time and people would come directly to me, um, cut, you know, through six levels of management um, because they felt they could, they had a, a safe place to, to raise concerns and that we could genuinely get them help. And I think... I think if we can um, provide a system that allows um, everybody to access those types of services in whatever organisation they're working in, whether it's family and domestic violence, whether it's sexual harassment, um, we create a safer place for, for, for everyone. Okay. So, Linda, um, would you want to respond to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, uh, one minute, the most successful program I've ever seen to address the issue of domestic violence in Aboriginal communities was done through the local rugby league club. Local rugby league clubs were sponsored 5,000 bucks, that's all it cost. Though we had about 30, the Wilcania Yabbies and uh, the uh, Laparoos Panthers and so on. And what happened, there was curriculum, there was training, we use ex-rugby league players and some non-Aboriginal women were from involved. The men that played rugby league signed a contract. They were the fathers, the brothers, the cousins. And if they stuffed up and had a DV assault charge against them, guess what? They weren't allowed to play rugby league. And at a local community level, it changed things. It worked. And, it and worked. Did, and did that change get embedded? It did. And some of those clubs, even though the funding has gone, change of governments do these things, but even though that funding has gone, they have maintained the program. OK. Well, that, I was going to ask you what needs to happen to bring Indigenous and non-Indigenous women together yeah. to demand change. And but perhaps the better issue question is if you were the Minister for Indigenous Affairs or Family That's Services or the Minister for Women, <laughs> what's the first thing you would do to try and affect that? I would look at things from a local perspective. There is no silver bullet that's going to sort this out. So it's almost a community by community organisation by organisation. And Fiona is absolutely correct. I cannot tell you the effect of trauma of the stolen generations and the way that that stops Aboriginal women reporting because I think they're going to lose their kids. That I think they're going to lose their kids because if the house is... The, the, the children will be taken to the, out of home care. Yeah, that's correct. So, but if I was the minister... Uh, the thing that really is important is to get immediate resources to people that are affected. Um, immediate resources. 
and uh, that's basically what we're working on at the moment. Uh, things called flexible support packages, 20,000, up to 20,000 bucks for a woman and her kids if they're leaving a violent relationship on whatever she wants to spend it on. If it's white goods, if it's a lease, if it's a bond, it doesn't matter. And that's, that's immediate resourcing. This might sound crazy, but resourcing um, um, refuges for women, for women's pets. You've got no idea how many women, particularly from rural, rural, the rural um, regions, stay in relationships because they've got responsibility for animals. It might be potty calves, it might be foals, it could be family, family, family pets. The really practical things, but getting resources immediately to people that need it. And the biggest issue I hear from, um, from the sector, Fran, is not to do with a response to violence, but it is availability of social housing. And, f and places for people to go. We know in some regions in New South Wales and across this country, there is no rental. So how can you leave a relationship in a small country town if there's nowhere for you to go to? These are the very practical and pragmatic things that need to take place. And uh, we should say, there, I mean, there was a pilot, for instance, of the immediate um, fleeing violence grants, wasn't there, in the, in the budget, up to $15,000, I think. So this is a pilot only. I think it's a pilot and it's, it's $1,500. $1,500, is it? That you get money oh, yeah. and the rest is in counselling services and so forth. Oh, you're right, a $5,000 yeah. grant, I think. But right. the other thing is that, you know, you, you should not have to use, if you're leaving violence, you should not have to use your um, holidays or your rec days to get out of that relationship. You should be supported, which is corporate Australia is doing a lot of this, for up to 10 days paid leave because you need that time. You get out of a violent relationship, I've done it myself, you just collapse. For three days, you don't know where you are because you've put up with that trauma for so long. So these things have to be considered by policymakers and politicians when they're thinking about the real issues faced by women. And Ray, we've been talking about working together in uh, in the context of reconciliation uh, and in, in the context of making change. Um, I think Linda started off saying, you know, Aboriginal women need to be uh, part of these discussions. They need to be part of the groups that are collecting the data, developing the policy, making the change. So is it about working together or is it a better way of saying that about learning from each other? A and what is it... I don't, even, I don't know even if you've, if you've had this, uh, had, had done this exercise, but within Indigenous culture that you think we can learn on, is it the notion of, of elders, as Fiona was talking about? Is there something you've seen within in the Indigenous community that you think we can all learn from? Yeah, and I think um, I've learnt a lot from Indigenous people in the time that I've been working in universities um, and also um, in the museum sector. And what I've learnt is to slow down um, and listen more. That um, we're all, well, people like myself are brought up in families where you're taught to advocate um, and speak up. And that's almost more important than listening. But um, what I think is, is really important if we are to work successfully together is that people, particularly like me, take the time to listen to what Indigenous people want and how they want to do things and not be in such a hurry to charge ahead and do what we think is right. And to listen, of course, then the Indigenous women need to be at that table. So that there for you to listen to, which is a significant change, I think, if we look at the groups, the advisory groups that get set up, um, they're often not there. Um, talking more broadly, Fiona, about reconciliation, and you, you touched on this, the Healing Foundation is calling for the National Intergenerational Healing Strategy, which includes truth-telling, healing through culture and community-led services. 
Um, how important is the truth-telling bit of that, Fiona? The process of acknowledging the past, of, of hearing what happened at the point of colonisation, you know, to, re to the reconciliation process more broadly for all of us. It's really important for so many reasons, but one of the biggest is that how, how do you um, make solutions for a problem you haven't framed properly because you're only dealing with part of the truth and not all of it? Uh, and, you know, we, we have this knowledge now, this evidence about um, the effects of removal uh, and, and how it, it manifests today. Uh, and... Um, Look, when, just going back to, uh, linking back to my previous comments, Fran, I, I don't want people here to go away thinking that um, we're going to heal ourselves in our, in our communities on our own because mm. that's part of it. But when you talk about how um, our people come together with non-First Nations peoples, I, I'm th I think about this... Um, this gathering we had in Townsville recently, and uh, you know, there's uh, there's a transient Palm Island community through there as well, and we had maybe about 40 people gathered who are all involved in local healing programs, and they're all volunteers. They're all tired, burnt out, doing the heavy lifting for this community with high rates of youth crime, high rates of trauma. And, um, you know, you had these elders that are saying, Fiona, I, um, I get $50 to go to the, the jail, uh, and guess what? I, this, there's this lady that's been in and out of there for 16 years, and I finally got through to her, and she doesn't want to be there anymore. And, you know, it breaks your heart. They, this, she's celebrating this, this triumph. Um, but they're all volunteers mm. and, um, you know, we don't get a lot of money ourselves as the Healing Foundation. We haven't had an increase in 12 years since we are operating, but the demand is huge. And so all I can really do with that is say, look, system by system until it's workforce by workforce and sector by sector, um, sorry, the other way around, Workforce by workforce and sector by sector until it's system by system, everybody needs to be trauma aware and healing informed. And if we're coming together, then everybody in those workforces, everybody in those settings that we interact with as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples needs to hear us, needs to validate our experiences and needs to be led by us with, with really solid solutions. I think that was... Um very clear in, in what I've read of the dialogues that led to the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Those gathered, uh, from what I've read, the clearest statement they wanted to make first was a recording of their history before they started talking about the constitutional, making the point that you cannot recognise that which you do not know. And I was really struck by an excerpt from one of them. This was from the Darwin, Darwin Regional Dialogue, which said, Australia must acknowledge its history, its true history, not Captain Cook, what happened all across Australia, the massacres and the wars. If that were taught in schools, we might have one nation where we are all together. Geraldine, do you think if that was taught in schools, that might make one nation, that would make a difference? Um, ab absolutely. So I've got nine and 11 year old um, um, kids um, and I have to say their school does a, a good job. Um, I think at, at, at bringing different perspectives on history into the curriculum and my son's going out to Gadooga to visit a um, central regional school um, in 12 hours out of Sydney next week as an exchange between the two schools to, to really try to just build that greater awareness. Um, but I absolutely agree. I think it's up to schools. It's the education system really needs to change. It needs to be across the system. Um, and it's up to also, I think the workforce has a role to educate our parents so that the parents are also able to bring um, bring um, and change the, the biases. Often when I see biases in the workforce and issues in the workforce where you're dealing with um, discrimination and racism, it's it's based off a belief of, of that they've grown up with. Um, and so then it becomes harder to 
um, harder to resolve it when people are bringing those biases that are so so um, unconscious into the workforce. So I think I think it's absolutely fundamental um, that we embrace the Uluru Statement, um, that we have this process of truth telling, um, that we we have our First Nations people really advise us on how we best um, update the curriculum um, nationally, um, state by state and locally, and then how we go about building the resources in our museums, um, in our um, public institutions to allow the community and, and parents to also reinforce um, that process. And it educates the parents as well. And I it's mean, not enough just to educate the kids in school. Perhaps, you know, I'm suffering from what Ray was saying. I just want it to all to happen more quickly. We've been talking about changing this curriculum for as long as I can remember. The Uluru Statement of from the Heart is four years old last week. Ray, if that's the blueprint... And, and I'm sure Linda w wants to chip in on this too, but if that's the blueprint of what First Australians um, have, have articulated, they want and need, presumably it's the bedrock then of successful reconciliation. If our government aren't responding in a timely way, can the rest of us do it without them? We can't hold a referendum, obviously, unless government's persuaded to, but, you know, what can we do? Well, I think... Um, at the Australian National University, we can do an awful lot because um, we have uh, fantastic historians who work already. Um, some of them are Indigenous and others work with Indigenous communities. And we would love to lead a process, a nationwide process. And here I'm plagiarising PDU's idea. Um, we have a, a local truth-telling that goes across the country so that you can imagine the whole of Australia as a mosaic of local communities investigating their own story of contact and coming to terms with that and owning up to it. And we've got a fabulous exhibition in the... Um, art and design um, gallery at the moment on the Mile Creek Massacre, which is an art installation um, which was produced primarily by Indigenous people, curated by um, Bianca Beetson um, from New England area. And that relates to you know, the famous Mile Creek Massacre, where the local people have come together and they've interviewed descendants of the perpetrators as well as descendants of the, the victims of that massacre. And they've um, told stories about it which actually, you know, try and reach a place where, as Bianca puts it, you can heal country. And it gets back to your point too about, about healing. And I think that's a great model that we could, if we applied that all across Australia and everybody confronted what went on in their backyard um, and tried to find a place to, to move on from that, I think that would be very powerful. And here at the ANU, we would love to um, facilitate um, and inspire that process. Linda, do you think that the, the Uluru Statement of the Heart basically really gives us the starting point for all the change that needs to happen? I do. And I do want to recognise Brian and the leadership this university has provided over um, some time in relation to the Uluru Statement. Um, and I had a Peter... Peter, you and I met last week and we spoke about truth-telling. So the Uluru Statement, um, I actually think, Fran, that the Australian community is ahead of politicians on this one. Well, we probably should remind people that four years on, the process, there is a process, the Indigenous Affairs Minister Ken Wyatt well, is, has started a process, but it's it stalled and it's stalling yeah. short of constitutional recognition. Um, well... Seems to be. i tell you what... Very briefly, uh, so the three working groups that Minister Wyatt has uh, set up that have undertaken a national consultation on what a voice might look like were forbidden. As in the terms of reference, which I have a copy of, of dealing with anything to do with Uluru. So what's being proposed is a legislated voice to the parliament. But I just want to put to the audience here tonight that we should not think a voice to the parliament and a Makarata Commission have to be dependent on each other. A Makarata Commission under Uluru 
has two responsibilities, a national process of truth-telling and national agreement-making, which is a nice way to say national treaty-making. South Australia um, and Victoria and other state governments are not waiting. They have started their own processes in terms of truth-telling and their own processes in terms of treaty-making, including the Northern Territory and Queensland. Um, it seems to me that what people need to come to terms with as well, that I reckon on back of the envelope, this is about 100 million bucks to do. To have a national process. To have a national process of agreement and treaty making and establish a Makarata Commission. You, you can't have, and I, I've been to Mile Creek and I've been to the, the, to the memorial and overlooked the massacre site. It's, it's amazing. It just, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but if you want uh, local governments, local historical societies, schools, local communities to get involved, you're going to have to pay for their, what they need to do. You, they, they, it doesn't... It can't be done without a proper budget. And a process of treaty making, um, the model that I have in mind, is led by uh, commissioners. And we have to remind ourselves, everyone, that this is going to take a long time. It is not something that you can do in two years. But we've had four years where this could have started, and it hasn't. We're almost, we're going to run out of time. We, we would like to invite a couple of questions from the audience in a moment, so we've probably only got time for a couple. But um, if you do have a question, I would ask you to move down to the microphone there on the side and line up there and I'll come to you. Um, so you can make your way down now if you do have a question. If you don't, we'll just keep chatting amongst <laughs> ourselves. Um, Fiona... Fiona, and I'll come to the questions in a moment. Just, Fiona, before I come to the audience questions, um, Linda's saying, OK, the government's... It's, it's going slow. It's not heading towards constitutional recognition at the moment. But let's not wait. Let's try and get the government to agree to some kind of Makarata truth-telling um, commission, as we've seen being set up in Victoria. But how important is in your view, the voice to reconciliation and how much is constitutional recognition crucial to it, for it to be embedded in the constitution? Look, I, it's, it's, it's really important. Uh, I, I, just, I just think of all the, the loss and the grief and the trauma, and I think something really big has to happen <laughs> um, because it's just long overdue. Uh, everything's long overdue in terms of healing. And, um, you know, even since the Bringing Them Home report, um, that's a whole new generation that's joined us, Earthside, since that report. You've got professors uh, and lecturers walking around here who, you know, um, were born after it. So uh, it's, we, can't, we can't afford to wait around for another generation to uh, join us. It has to be something as big as that, and it, it is possible. Um, there is um, a people, there, it's, people are positive about it. Um, and I, I know from working alongside stolen generation survivors and their descendants and their families and the communities, some of them I've already mentioned, that they see where they are now and the trauma that's happened, you know, that's transferred across generations as being the result of the absence of a voice, the absence of truth-telling in any formal way, um, and the absence of true reconciliation through something like a Makarata Commission. And do you, as a young Indigenous leader, think constitutional recognition is key to that? Is there a, I noticed from the Uluru process, this, the fear seemed to be without it, it's impermanent. Any change is impermanent. Yeah, look, I am, and I, um, I was fortunate to see how those dialogues happened across the country, and um, it was done properly. We had 
really, um, really amazing leaders that have been there from the start involved in, in, in all of them. And um, there was, I remember, I remember looking on and saying, there's, there's no way they're going to come up with one statement <laughs> and there's no way that we could come up with, you know, agree mm. to such powerful actions, but, but we did. They did. And that means something. And the work of our, uh, our foundation, um, I, I, we pride ourselves on, on, on bringing the right people together to discuss the right things, to create um, action plans um, in the right directions. And so um, that was that on a bigger scale. And um, it's one of those things, it's unprecedented and it's once in a lifetime yeah. type I think type we have a, a fabulous template now well, that yeah. worked. Look, um, we do. And no, nothing else comes close to it, really. Um, and even some of the things that are happening in different jurisdictions, they're, they're piecemeal, and some of them are causing more trauma. Um, and we know that from working in communities, and so it's really important that we get something that's nationally consistent, that's informed by what we know about healing, effective healing, and what we know about um, addressing trauma. Okay. Now, we have a question here, I think, and I ask all of you to keep your questions pretty short because we're really pushing it. Yes, thank you. Um, today, I got an email from the War Memorial as I do every month, saying uh, what's on, on in June. And one of the things they're celebrating is that all the Indigenous people who uh, fought and in many cases died for uh, this country in World War I and II, but not a mention, not, not a w single word about what happened beforehand with all the massacres and, and the frontier wars that went on. And yet I see our government is determined to spend $500 million to um, enlarge the war memorial and make it just a sort of a showcase for weapons of war. Linda, d is there any movement at all in parliament to get the recognition of the frontier wars and, as you say, that tell the truth about our history and what happened uh, when settlement came to, white settlement came to this country and should be included in the War Memorial? Um, there isn't a lot of movement across the parliament, but can I just say that one of the things I've set myself before I die is that that joint is going to recognise what happened in this country prior to World War I. Fiona, I think I'm right in saying that you're proposing, part of your proposal from the Healing Foundation is a healing centre which includes some kind of memorial in Canberra, I think on the banks of the lake you're talking about, let's aim big. Um, that, so if not in the War Memorial, which you know, Linda set her sights on, you know, is there another place where this recognition could, you know, to be built for these stories? Hopefully. Uh, and the idea behind that, and it, again, is a wonderful idea from survivors themselves, uh, is to get... Uh, expose as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, to this to this healing that needs to happen and and how it needs to happen and um, it it should have the truth telling. It should tell the stories, um, but it should also talk about um, healing movement and um, reconciliation movements. And so, um, it's it was part of our pre budget submission this year, but um, we'll we'll keep pushing for that. <laughs> We know there's a memorial there now in Reconciliation Place that acknowledges the stories, but uh, we're looking at things like, um, well, oh, well, I ask this, it's their, their mission is to tell the stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, but I, I've said to them, you can't do that without us, <laughs> without um, what we know from our survivors, from the truth telling from survivors and how they've gotten through it and how they want to lead this intergenerational healing movement. And so, um, you know, there's some hope there, but it costs a lot of money. Well, it costs a lot of money, but we're spending a lot of money at the moment, so yeah. now is the season, I think, for this. Yes. <laughs> um, and one thing to be sure is we do need a place for all of us to go and hear the stories. If we're still not learning them in the classrooms e enough, 
We need a place, whether it's in our war memorial or it's by the lake in a healing, we need the stories for us to know, because without knowing, we can't understand. Look, thank you all of you for not asking a lot of questions. That's tremendous, because we are out of time. So just to finish off, a quick thought from all of our panel. Let's start with you, Geraldine. A, a thought from you about reconciliation and, and how to get there and how women might lead that. Um, so I think from my perspective as a half Chinese um, Australian woman, um, I don't believe we can create a country of welcome, a country of inclusion, organisations of inclusion, until um, we've embraced the Uluru Statement, until we've gone through um, the truth-telling process. So from my perspective, I think um, everyone like me needs to use our voice and we need to, um, to stand up and be bold and brave and, and call and support it to get the community support so we can get, for example, a constitutional referendum approved. So that using our voice to support that so we can move to the next stage. Fiona, a final thought from you? Oh, gosh, it's tough to have a fun. Uh, I'm at the press club tomorrow, everyone. <laughs> that's right. In fact, that's a great final thought. Tune in Thank you. tomorrow at 12.30. Is it we tune in? Is it televised? I should know this. It is. It's televised. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> Right. Um, my final thought is that you know we can all act as citizens, but we can also act from the positions that we have um, in the community. So um, those of us, you know, lots of us here in the university, we can um, use our influence to ensure that you know education we know is the key to a lot of this stuff, and we are in a fantastic position to ensure that the next generation um, of educators and politicians and community leaders um, know more about um, the things they need to know to to make this country heal. Linda, I know you have a final thought. My final thought is that reconciliation is not a destination. Reconciliation is a journey. And we're all part of that journey. And don't ever feel that this is such a big issue. What do, what do I, what matter? It's the humble acts of reconciliation that bring about change. That's a terrific note to end on. Could you please thank the panel, Linda Burney, Fiona Cornforth, Ray Francis and Geraldine Chin Moody. What a terrific discussion. Thank you, all of you.